James chapter 1, verse 25. Last week, we covered the first section of that verse. We saw how James admonishes us to look into the perfect law of liberty. We're to look into it, to investigate it, we saw. that The word looketh into meant to investigate, to do careful and close search. Today, we're going to look at the second half of that verse, and we're going to see what it has to say for us. We read, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and now this portion we're looking at today, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And the phrase that I want us to focus in on today, to look at, is continueth therein. And you know the old saying, how that a picture is worth a thousand words? Rather than explain to you the intricacies of the word that is translated, continueth therein, I just want to show you a picture so you can kind of get the idea of it. Somebody who continues at something. We call it in English persistence. Somebody who does not give up until it is done. That's what it means to continue therein. As we look into the law of liberty, the things that we learn, the things that we discover, God intends that we continue therein. Not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work until that work is done. God wants us to be persistent in a good work. Continue at it. Be not weary in well-doing, knowing that we shall receive our reward in due time, just as this little fellow will. Now, the question is, how can law give liberty? Last week, I promised we'd give an answer to that. We saw this false idea of liberty that is prominent in the world, this false system of liberty that is really doing as thou wilt. Today, we're going to see how it is that God's law can justly be called a law of liberty. Because most of the world, and I would even say most Christians today, think that wherever there is law, there's no liberty. There's restriction to freedom. There's restriction to liberty. But we're going to see today how law gives liberty. We're going to be answering that question. How can, that is, God's law, give liberty? And we're going to begin by defining some of our terms. We're going to look first at the word law. What does it mean? According to Noah Webster, law is defined as a rule, particularly an established or permanent rule prescribed by the supreme power of a state to its subjects for regulating their actions, particularly their social actions. So laws among men are put in place particularly to regulate or guide their social interactions. Their actions in particular one toward another. We call this civil law. And we're going to see what that produces. So law is a rule that is to govern our actions, specifically toward one another. And now let's look at the principle of liberty. We looked at the first part of Noah Webster's definition of liberty. We saw that, according to the world, they define it as having no restriction, being able to think and act as one sees fit. That we call natural liberty. But in the second part of this definition, he says this. Natural liberty, dot, 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 this liberty is abridged by the establishment of government. Do you understand? Do you know what it means to abridge something? To circumvent it. You abridge it. So this idea of natural liberty is abridged. It is circumvented by government. Wherever there is government, this idea of liberty does not exist. It's abridged wherever there is government. Now I ask you the question, is there a government in this world? Yes. Is there a government in this land? Yes, there is. 
Is there a government in this universe? Has there ever been a time when there is no government? There has been no government? No. So has this false idea of liberty ever existed? Has there ever been freedom according to this idea? No, there hasn't. All created beings have been subject to government. The question is, what kind of government? When natural liberty comes under law, what happens? It produces what we call civil liberty or freedom. Have you ever heard of the phrase civil liberty? Rules are intended to regulate our interactions on a civil level, one to another. And when government is brought into place, it produces what we call civil liberty or civil freedom. How does this work? That's a good question, one that I am going to try to answer today. Let's look at defining civil liberty. Now, this again is according to Noah Webster. He says, civil liberty is an exemption from the arbitrary will of others, which exemption is secured by established laws, which restrain every man from injuring or controlling another. Hence, the restraints of law are essential to civil liberty. The liberty of one depends not so much on the removal of all restraint from him as on the due restraint upon the liberty of others. You see, this is the idea of civil liberty. This is how freedom exists in this world, where there is government, where there is law. If I act in accordance with the law, you have no need to fear. You are free. But if I abridge that freedom, if I act contrary to the law, and I encroach upon your rights, you have lost your freedom. And this is the principle upon which God's government is based, that all men should act in accordance with his law. And so long as we do, there is freedom. But when we rebel against that law, we encroach upon the freedom and liberty of others. And we give right for our own to be encroached upon. Now, I want to share with you a statement. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is civil liberty. This is that principle of God's government. Here the Apostle Paul is helping us understand what it means to be free how we secure our own freedom and the freedom of every man. We walk in the flesh. I have a fleshly body, as we all do. We walk in that flesh, but our war is not with flesh, is it? We're not fighting a war against flesh and blood. We are fighting a spiritual battle. Our warfare, the weapons of our warfare, are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they are what? Mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. What kind of strongholds? Pride. Every wicked and evil thought in the mind. This is the battle that every Christian is to wage faithfully and to continue therein, being a faithful hearer of the word of God, a faithful hearer of the law. He is to continue in these things. He's not to be a forgetful hearer, because his job is to cast down his imaginations, not anyone else's imaginations, his own. Casting down his imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Into the what? The obedience of Christ. We are to bring ourselves in subjection to God. Thus we secure liberty and freedom. 
You see, the principle of God's government is self-government. It depends upon self-government. Self-government is the principle that underpins everything in this universe. And so long as we exercise self-government or self-discipline or control, we secure our own freedom and the freedom of others. Then it is that God's law is a law of liberty. Notice also, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Again, this is self-government. That is the principle being expressed here by the Apostle Peter. We are free, but we are not to use our liberty as a cloak for maliciousness, to cover our own evil, wicked lusts, and to excuse and justify them. But we are to act and think in accordance with the word and law of God. Again, the apostle declares, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto what? Righteousness. You see, the question is, to whom will we yield? To whom will we yield? Will determine whether we are free or a slave. Because what this world calls freedom is really the basis of all slavery, the most degrading of all slavery, the in, most inhuman of all slavery. If you don't believe me, just go watch the news. You see, true liberty is the object, the aim, the goal of all discipline, all instruction and education is to bring true liberty, to teach us how to govern ourselves. And I might say, it's another way of saying the fear of God. It was the very first principle that God instituted in the Garden of Eden. After he had created man, he put him to test to see if man would be capable of governing himself. He said, see, I have given you every tree of the garden. Of them you may freely eat, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God gave a law. He put man under government, and he said, now you must govern yourself. Before man could be trusted with the government of the world and all those that should be born to him and entrusted to his care, God needed to know, and all the universe needed to know, that man was capable of governing himself. And so man was put under test in the Garden of Eden, as we read. Thou shalt not eat of it. And we see in Isaiah chapter 1, the last part of verse 16 and the first part of verse 17, also bring out this principle. God is pleading with the children of Israel, and he says, Cease to do evil, learn to do well. You see, that is the object of all true education, is to teach us what sin is. That's what the sanctuary service and the law of God was given to do, to teach us what sin is, that we might cease from it, and to show us what true righteousness is, that it's faith, not a blind faith, not an inactive faith, but a faith that works, a living faith that brings the proper sacrifice to God. And Paul tells us what that well-pleasing sacrifice is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We are that sacrifice. As we offer ourselves to God, it is a most pleasing sacrifice to Him, showing that we are not conformed to this world, but that we have been transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we might prove to the universe, the onlooking world, what is that perfect and well-pleasing will of God. You see, God wants us to cease from evil and learn to do well. Here's a statement from Periodical, the youth instructor. Here the author, author tells us the object of discipline 
instruction. She says, The religious work which the Lord gives to young men and to men of all ages shows his respect for them as his children. What is this work that God has given the sons of men that shows his respect for them as his children? He gives them the work of self-government. That is the work which shows God's tremendous respect for mankind. He has given them a free will, a mind capable of understanding his purpose, his will for them. And he said, I have made you free to choose. Show that you can choose rightly. I have set before you life and death, good and evil, blessing and cursing. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Again, we read in the book Education. The object of discipline is the training of the child for self-government. Why do we discipline? Why do we instruct? That we, as children, may learn to govern ourselves. That is the role of parents. You see, the future of our society, the future of all nations, depends upon the faithfulness of men and women in the home, teaching their children to govern themselves according to the law of God. Thus, we secure liberty and freedom to all men. But when we fail as parents, when we fail as brethren, when we fail as pastors and ministers to do this very important work, we fail God and we dishonor God. We become rebels. Again, I want to notice a statement. Now, this is taken from one of the founders of this nation. The qualifications for self-government in society are not innate. What does he mean? We're not born with them. We may think we are, but we are not. They are the result of habit and long training. As babes, we're not born with that principle. We have to learn it, and it is the role of parents to instruct their children how to govern themselves. And if we ourselves have not been instructed, we cannot teach our children. And that is why society is in the state that it is. That's why there's no freedom, you see. Again, this is taken from the fifth volume of the Testimonies. We read, when you decide that as Christians you are not required to restrain your thoughts and feelings, you are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. You see, when we think that we are free and can do as we please, when we come under the influence of this false liberty, this true slavery, we bring ourselves under the command and control of devils. The devil delights for us to think that we can govern ourselves because he knows he's more powerful than we are. And he can get us to do his bidding. He knows he can deceive us. And the moment he thinks, or the moment he sees that we believe that our own will, our own intelligence is a, a sufficient guide for us, he knows he's got us. If he can get us to turn away from the law of God, away from his word, and look to ourselves for guidance, what I think, what I feel. If we can make the Bible a private interpretation, Satan is happy with that. He delights because he knows he will manipulate our interpretation. He knows we are ignorant of his presence, of his wiles, and of his working. And he will put thoughts in our minds. He will stir up feelings and passions in the man or woman and lead them to do according to his pleasure, all the while thinking they are free and doing their own will, when in reality, they're his servants. You see, in this world, and you look throughout the history of this world, you see this universal phenomenon. What am I talking about? What universal phenomenon? It revolves around government. From the time that 
Earth's first government existed, you see that men were given but few laws. Adam had one. The children of Israel were given ten. In reality, they were all under the ten laws. But they didn't know about it, all of them, at first. Adam only knew of the first law, which was, Thou shalt not eat. And he was under that law. You see, God gives but a few laws. And when you look at the earliest civilizations, that of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, these ancient civilizations, they all began either with no laws or but a few laws. But you see, as, as they grew, those laws multiplied. And we went from few laws to many laws. For instance, in the days of Assyria, they had but a handful of laws in the beginning. But toward midway of the Assyrian Empire, you had the law of Hammurabi. And on that tablet, you can still see it today, there existed over 300 laws, civil laws. And there were hundreds more added before Assyria came to its end. And you see this repeated time after time, empire after empire. Rome began with a few laws. And it had, in the end, before it fell, a multitude of laws. Our own nation was created with a document that if you put on pages of 8 and a half by 11, would only take six pages. Now that might seem like a lot. But today, the laws of this land, we have volumes, scores, tens of thousands of pages just for financial laws. That's not including the civil codes. Tens of thousands, if not well over 100,000 pages of laws. Many laws, or few laws to many laws. Why? Why do we see this phenomenon repeating in history over and over again? I'll show you why. A gentleman by the name of A.T. Jones, in his book, The Two Republics, states it in exquisite language. He tells us why all the laws of Rome were powerless. He says, there was no public character to sustain them, and consequently they were made only to be broken. In this condition of affairs, such laws were nothing more nor less than a legal farce. And that is really the reality in all governments today. Their laws are nothing more than a legal farce because there's no moral character in the public or in the leaders to sustain them. Every official is ready to break the law at the drop of a hat, and he'll even drop the hat for you. And we condemn our leaders, but we people are no different. The moment there's no cop, we're speeding. The moment there's no law, or we think there's no law, that nobody's looking, what are we doing? We show to the universe and the onlooking worlds that there's no moral character in us to sustain God's law. We show that we are incapable of governing ourselves. And we bring shame and reproach upon God. And when you look down through history, you look at the prophecies, you will see a pattern that governments and these ancient governments moved from east to west. You see the ancient Eastern Oriental empires, and they moved to Europe. And from Europe, we read that it moved to this land. Freedom has moved westward. Every time freedom would reign, tyranny would oppress, and men would flee westward to find freedom. And then Satan would come in and lead men into this slavery, and men would become tyrants and oppress the people, and more men would flee further west until they came to this land, the last bastion of hope. There's no farther west you can go. There's nowhere else to go. The prophecy cannot go further west. This land will be the last proving ground as to whether God will have a people who can govern themselves. And you know what? 
Our forefathers knew this. Let me share with you a few statements from them. This is taken from Je Jefferson, writing to a man, Walter Jones. And here he's speaking about President Washington. He says this, He, General Washington, has often declared to me that he considered our new Constitution as an experiment on the practicability of Republican government. And with what dose of liberty man could be trusted for his own good. That he was determined the experiment should have a fair trial and would lose the last drop of his blood in support of it. You see, our forefathers understood what they were doing when they came to this nation. What they were doing in establishing this government. They realized that this was the last bastion of hope for this world. To prove to all the world and all the universe that men could govern themselves. And they said, we're willing to shed the last drop of our blood to see that men have a fair trial at this. Again, Jefferson says, I have no fear, but that the result of our experiment will be that men may be trusted to govern themselves without a master. They believed that given the right opportunity, men could show themselves capable of governing themselves. They believed it. The government was established to provide that for men that men would be able to live according to the dictates of their own conscience. They would be free. He says, Could the contrary of this be proved? I should conclude either that there is no God or that He is a malevolent being. You see, they believed that this was the foundation of heaven's government. And that if it didn't work, well, then there was no God. It was a sufficient proof that there is no God. But you know, God says he will have 144,000 who will not bow the knee to Baal, just as there were 7,000 in the days of Elijah. God will have 144,000 in these days that will show that this hope will be fulfilled. They will show to the onlooking universe that God has a people who can govern themselves, who are free, and who live in the law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty. And again, this is taken from James Madison. Speaking on this subject, he says, that honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom to rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. You see, they understood that this was a grand experiment, that this was the last hope of this world to show that men could govern themselves. Are we willing to show that we can do this? Are we willing to prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God? Are you willing to be a part of that experiment and to show to all men and all angels and to all the beings of unfallen worlds that God is just and fair in giving us our freedom. Let me close with just a couple of thoughts. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus lays down the principle to help us understand how heaven works. He states it in these words. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. These two are saying the same thing. Jesus is saying, but whosoever shall deny me before men will be denied before his Father which is in heaven. And he shows us how we are accepted, how we can show ourselves approved unto God, that workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says, if we will take up his cross, deny ourselves, that is, govern ourselves, 
restrain ourselves. He says, then are we his followers. You, we take up our cross and we follow him. It's not enough simply to take up the cross, but we must follow Christ with that cross. We must bear the burden of Calvary every day upon our heart and upon our mind because that was the burden of the Son of Man, the burden of the Son of God, and he's given us that cross to bear. I want to share with you a statement that helps us understand one way one of the greatest ways in which we deny Christ. In the Signs of the Times, August 1st, 1900, Sister White wrote these words, speaking of King Saul in the Old Testament. She says, shall we deny our Redeemer? Question mark. You say, no, I will never deny Christ. And I know that every single one here would say that same thing. None of us would purposely deny Christ. But there's a way in which we deny him without realizing it. She says, Saul, the first king of Israel, denied the Lord by disobeying his commands. He failed to obey the first law of God's kingdom. What is that law? The law of self-government. Saul denied God by showing himself incapable of governing himself. And that's called heaven's first law. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. Self-government. She continues. He set up his own will as better than the Lord's will. That false idea or theory of liberty that I talked about last week. His life was a failure because he denied God. And I dare say that everyone who proves themselves a failure will have proven themselves a failure for this reason. Everyone who denies God in the end will deny God for this reason. They have shown themselves unfit to live in God's kingdom, unfit for the freedom that he has given them. But God has given to us admonition, hope, and promise that we are not to struggle in this warfare alone. We are not to struggle in our own power. God has promised both to will and to do of his good pleasure in us, I want to leave us with a couple of thoughts. What is the moral? The apostle says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. We all know how hard it is to govern ourselves. We become weary and faint, tired at constant exertion of our will, to not do that which comes naturally to us. Restraining our selfishness, restraining our pride, restraining our words and even our thoughts is a constant battle that can weary us. But we are admonished. We are comforted. Do not grow weary in well-doing. And God lays before us a blessed hope that that which we have sown, we will also reap if we will only remain faithful, the day of harvest will come when we will forget all the trial, all the difficulty. Just as a woman in labor, she's concentrating, she's thinking of that pain of bringing a man into the world. But if her mind can be taken away from that pain to the hope of what that child will bring to the world, and the moment that child is brought forth, she immediately forgets all the pain and trial for the joy that another man has brought into the world. You see, if we will remain faithful and not grow weary in well-doing, we will see that new man born 
into God's kingdom. We will reap the fruit of our sowing. And we will reap a harvest that will cause all the hardships and difficulties, struggles and trials of this world to become dim and insignificant. They will go dim in the light of His glory and His grace. And Paul, uh, excuse me, James tells us, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Do you want to be free? This is his admonition to us. If you want to be free, then so act and so speak as those that are free, as those that are God's children. God wants us to be his children. He wants us to be an example to the onlooking world of himself. That men may know that we have been with Christ. That we have learned from him. That we are not of this world, even as he was not of this world. And that our God, our king, is not of this world. But one day, his kingdom shall be of this world. And is that your hope to be in that kingdom? Let us bow before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I thank Thee for giving us this day Thy daily bread. I thank Thee for forgiving us our sins in proportion as we are willing to forgive those that are indebted to us. I bless Thee and thank Thee, Father, for leading us not into temptation, but delivering us from evil. Father, for showing us the way of escape, pointing us to the Lamb, pointing us to him who would be uplifted as the serpent of old was, as the hope of all men, that we might look to him and live. Father, I thank thee for thy great and wondrous love, for the gift of thy dear Son, and for the gift that thou hast given to us through him, of a conscience and a free will. Father, we want to choose thee this day, we want to choose Thee as our Lord, as our King. We want to accept Thy Son as our Lord and Savior. We want to follow Him whithersoever He goeth. Father, we want to be the free subjects of Thy kingdom. And we pray and uplift ourselves to Thee. For we know that of ourselves we are incapable, but we know that with Christ all things are possible and that we can do all things through him. So, Father, we submit ourselves to thee. We pray that thou wilt work out in us thy will and good pleasure, that thou wilt perfect that work that thou hast begun in us, even into the day of the coming of thy Son, that thou mayest be glorified, that men may see, and not us, but they may see Jesus in us, that they may know what it is to be free and that their hearts too may long and desire for that freedom. Father, I pray that we may be as Jesus prayed, lights in this world that may be set upon a lampstand to give light to all the house that all may be drawn to that light which is Jesus and that we may be as salt in the earth to give the savor of life unto life to them that are in the the shadow and valley of death. Father, bless thy people, not because we are worthy, but because we stand in need of thee. We humbly implore, thou Father, that thou wilt exalt us, not that we may be exalted, but that Jesus may be exalted through us, that through the light that thou hast given us, that that light might shine out to others, and others might be made free for whom the son of god make free they are free indeed and father we pray that we might be free and that we might be vessels 
for the setting free of the captive, the setting at liberty of them that are captives. Father, we bless thee and thank thee. May thy word enter our hearts and minds. May it bear fruit in us for thy honor and glory. For this we ask in the blessed name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.